Good evening, good morning, good day, wherever you might be in the world. Welcome to ASRG, the fifth webinar. Uh, we'll get started here in the next few minutes, but uh, while we're waiting for everybody to get uh, settled, find the link and get into the, the YouTube channel, uh, we do have a little survey that we like to show at the beginning of each of the webinars. And um, we have three questions today, but uh, we'll go through them one by one. So if you can go to pollev.com slash ASRG, and you should be able to show where you're coming from. It'll show up directly on the screen here. Uh, it's live, so you'll be able to see who else on the webinar is also uh, calling in and from where. This is fully anonymous, so there is no data tracked here. It's no user data either. So go ahead, uh, log in to pollev.com slash ASRG. Uh, show where you're coming from. Looks like uh, someone's already logged in and coming from, I would assume, California, Germany, so go ahead, put in where you're, where you're uh, joining the webinar from tonight and you can start to see where other people are joining from. And if you're just joining us, then please, this is the fifth ASRG webinar. And we're doing a little poll at the beginning here. Um, if you can go to pollev.com slash ASRG and just put in where you're joining the webinar from tonight. Uh, it looks like we have Oh, a few people from, from Germany, uh, maybe Michigan in the USA, uh, California, so on. Uh, we've put the link for pollev.com slash ASRG in the chat, in the live chat window, um, as well it's in the comments. So please take a look, click on it, show, tell us where you're joining the webinar from tonight looks like UK somewhere. A bunch of people from from Germany, a few from the US. And we'll get started just here in a few minutes. So if you're just joining us, um, Welcome to the fifth webinar for ASRG. We are, um, we have a little poll at the beginning of our meetings to kind of uh, start the interaction. You know, with a webinar, it's not so easy to have interaction between the people joining. So uh, here you have the opportunity to say, hey, I'm coming from or I'm, I'm located in Germany or UK or US. So Thousand Oaks, California, Detroit, Michigan, I see UK, uh, Stuttgart, Germany, and Florida. Interesting. So um, we, we do have a few other questions tonight as well. Um, Tonight's topic is focused on GPS a little bit, and we'll, we'll get to that later, but um, I have a few questions regarding GPS and, and your knowledge of GPS. So I'm going to switch over to the next question. And if you look on your phone or wherever you're uh, logged in to pollev.com slash ASRG, you'll be able to answer the next question and it's also live. So <clears throat> the question is, um, are you currently using GPS technology in your platform or at work or wherever you might be 
doing things. Uh, we have a few questions or answers here. The first one is yes. Don't worry though, it's completely secure. No problem. The second answer is yeah, uh, GPS is being used for our safety critical systems. You can already start to see people answering the questions here. And then we have also the next answer is yes, uh, GPS is being used for our non-safety critical systems. The fourth answer is no, GPS is not currently being used. And the last question is, well, uh, what is GPS? So if, if you do have this what is GPS question, then you're probably in the right place. The guys later will address this question. So but uh, it looks like we're getting some good responses here. And if around 40% are saying that GPS is being used for safety critical systems, um, this could be for automotive or airplanes or whatever, but um, just the difference between safety critical and non-safety critical, 42% to 26%. Uh, it's really, really interesting to see. Okay, and you guys can continue to, to answer the questions later during the presentations as well. Uh, I'm glad to see that we don't have uh, what is GPS, <laughs> but um, let's move on to the next question. So how well do you know GPS spoofing? And the first answer is, well, yeah, dude, I am the Yoda master of GPS spoofing. Okay, I know everything. The second question or second answer is, I'm using GPS spoofing regularly to develop or test our own systems. Um, then we have the third answer is, I've done it once or twice, you know, just played around with it a little bit. And then the last one is, okay, well, I know GPS, but what really is GPS spoofing? So if you guys go ahead and answer these questions, uh, it helps build the presentation so the guys later can also tailor it to, to fit, um, fit the audience. That's very cool. I really like how this is, how this uh, Pole EV works and you can see directly on the screen from your participation, uh, from the, the viewers themselves who is, um, to get some feedback. So, very cool. So a little, about 10% are saying, yeah, I've, I'm have i using it, maybe not in their daily life, but at least developing or testing systems. 33% saying, well, I've used it once or twice, probably played with it a little bit. And 59% of you guys are saying, well, GPS spoofing, ah, I'm not quite sure what this is here. Don't worry, we'll get there. Oh, and of course, Yoda has just entered. So um, don't worry if you don't know what GPS spoofing is, this will be covered later. Um, really interesting topic today regarding GPS uh, and Tesla as well. So um, great guys, thank you for you know participating in this little survey, helps us get a better understanding of who's who's joining, where you're joining from, also what kind of experience you have with the topics. So very nice, thank you. All right, so I think we can go ahead and get started. It's about six minutes after. And so I'm gonna jump over to our ASRG presentation here. And just quickly, 
I want to welcome everybody to the fifth ASRG webinar. I think it's the fifth one now. Um, my name is John Heldreth. I'm the founder of Automotive Security Research Group, or ASRG, and we have a really great presentation for you today. Uh, there we go. So today we have Roy and Dora from Regulus Cybersecurity. They're going to talk about lessons learned for automotive navigation after the Tesla GPS attack or GPS hack. So nothing is it's not going further good fun all right um so just a little bit about the voices behind here so my name is john heldreth like i said i'm the founder of asrg uh that's what i do in my free time of course during the day i'm i'm the product security lead at porsche engineering and we also have today Sven Schran with us. Sven, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, of course. So welcome um, all of your participants. Also some words to me. Uh, so in my professional life, I'm a um, product security officer and work for the Robot Bosch GmbH. And um, in RSRG, of course, I also be engaged uh, in my free time. And um, here I have the lead for the location in Stuttgart. Very good. Thank you, Sven. Uh, Sven will join us again afterwards at the end of the presentation to take your questions and get some answers from the Regulus team. Um, I just want to quickly go over what is ASRG, what we're trying to accomplish. Um, ASRG is a nonprofit company, and we are focusing on the advancement of the automotive security industry. This community is for you. It's to learn, to support, and to advance our understanding of bringing secure automotive products to the market. Um, in security, we all have the same goals. We're trying to keep our customers, our families, our friends, data safe and secure, which can only be achieved together. Um, ASRG is focusing on three main areas. The first one being knowledge to ensure that we, like the people that are actually working on automotive security solutions in the vehicles, that we're making the best decisions, recommendations and integrations. To do this, we need to understand where to find information. We need to learn to have the competencies ourselves and build them up in the industry. The second part is networking. Um, networking, if, if you can't find the information, if you don't know where, these, um, where the information might be located, um, then having a network of professionals is very important. Um, they might know where to look or have experiences or recommendations. We can't know everything ourselves. However, as a community, we are stronger together. And together, we can support each other. And the last point or focus for ASRG is collaboration. <laughs> there are many projects that you would like to do probably at work, but uh, it doesn't make so much sense for the company. It's not a strategic point that the company is focusing on. So, however, these, these ideas, these topics would probably benefit the industry um, <clears throat> as a whole and not just your company. So, um, since ASRG is a nonprofit organization, we are unbiased and offer a space where members and sponsors can innovate together outside of your company. So just a little bit about what we're doing at ASRG. Um, just a quick overview. We have 
I think 22 different locations currently. Um, we're all over the world. If you look here and see that maybe a location is, is not near you or um, maybe you, you are near a location, but if, if you don't see a location here, this doesn't mean that you, we can't have your, your own location or um, you can start your own. But take a look here, ASRG is worldwide, USA, even Brazil in Recife, they are also having a, a location. Oxford, England, here in Germany, we have Stuttgart, Munich, Berlin, Rheingebiet, so the Frankfurt area, Tel Aviv, Cairo, in Egypt. We have uh, India, we have two, Bangalore and, and Delhi, in Japan, in Tokyo, Shanghai, Singapore, and Sydney. So, oh, and of course, Romania, I'm sorry, I forgot, but um, we are worldwide. So we have around 3,500 members currently, 22 locations. So um, <laughs> this is, this is uh, the, the size of ASRG currently. So how to get involved with ASRG? Um, you can attend local meetups uh, right now. Please don't do this because currently with the situation with uh, Corona or COVID, uh, this is not recommended. So this is why we have the webinars currently. However, you can attend a local meetup. You can start your own chapter. Get Join a project, get involved, collaborate, get to know the people. Um, be a part of ASRG actively. Well, how are you gonna do this? We're all in home right now, so we, we all need to stay at home, or most of us at least. Um, there are many ways for us to connect worldwide. And the first one is Slack channel. So we have a Slack channel that's dedicated to ASRG topics. We also have a Telegram so please um, use these two instant communication methods to get in touch with us, to ask questions to the community, to uh, also give links or information, whatever you think might be interesting for the community as well. So hopefully everybody was able to get a little screenshot or get their handies up to the, the screen. Uh, we also have two social media outlets. Um, we have Twitter and LinkedIn. These are our two main ways of providing information over social media. So you can also join us uh, or follow us on Twitter, uh, follow us on LinkedIn. I have also added the links um, in the comments as well. So please uh, click on the links, go uh, join the conversation. Very good. We have a lot of webinars planned. We have some cool things coming up. So May 14th, next week, Thursday. Uh, Ian Tabor is going to join us. Uh, he will give a discussion about um, how he did um, did a hack on his own car and then rebuilt the car in a box so that he could reverse engineer it. And if you know Ian Tabor, this guy, this is Minty Nets, um, he's going to, he's responsible for the car hacking village in the UK. Very interesting talk coming up. The week after, so Thursday, May 21st, Cyber Threat Intelligence, Top Gun Style. Marcus Auer from Threat Quotient. It's a really interesting discussion about threat modeling uh, and risk assessments. Going to be interesting. May 28th, the week after, so every week, Dynamic Trust Models for Mobility During Lifecycle. And this is 
Mirko Ross from Asvin. Uh, he'll be joining us um, and giving the talk about dynamic trust models. Then June 4th, telem telematic control unit in security presented by Vodafone, Jafra. Uh, again, these are great talks, great discussions that are going to be coming up in the next few weeks. We have webinars planned up until I think July sometime. If you would like to do something, if you would like to present at ASRG, you want to be a part of a webinar, please let us know. Get in contact with us through the communication channels. So I always have to state this, but um, since ASRG is a nonprofit association, we we want to keep it free for our members, and this is why we need sponsors. Um, so if you have an idea about how you or your company can sponsor ASRG to be a part of this driving automotive security community, um, please contact us. You can contact us at hello at asrg.io. This is a great opportunity for sponsors. It's global branding, access to exclusive content, post opportunities, find talent, build up the industry. So please contact us if you'd like to support. All right, so now the reason that everybody came to this webinar is not to listen to me all night, but actually to hear Roy and Dror um, from Regulus talk about lessons learned for automotive navigation after the Tesla GPS hack. So I, uh, I have the unique pleasure to, to hand this over to Roy and Dror, and they're going to take us through the next hour, hour and a half of GPS hacks. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Roy. Hello, this is Dror. Uh, thank you very much, John and uh, Sven, for having us. And thank you, everyone, who uh, tuned in to watch this uh, talk. I hope that uh, this will uh, live up to your expectations. The presentation you're about to see is actually exploring a, a research that took place uh, at the end of last year. And that research uh, was a very, very uh, innovative uh, research in the field of uh, cybersecurity, but specifically uh, in the field of uh, GPS spoofing, uh, where we explored the different effects of a typical uh, GPS hack on a vehicle that already exists on the road. So uh, we'll start off by saying a few words about uh, Regulus. We were founded in late 2016. We are still a startup. We are based in Israel, in the city of Haifa in the north. Uh, our main goal is to offer cybersecurity technologies that address uh, sensors and GPS for multiple industries, not just automotive. We're also looking uh, and working in uh, maritime, aviation, mobile phones, infrastructure, uh, a really big variety of uh, target markets. Uh, I myself am a former military uh, officer, and uh, I uh, worked a lot with uh, drones and different autonomous systems, and that's what uh, got me into the field of also autonomous vehicles and dealing with uh, marketing cybersecurity technologies for them and their uh, drawer. So I'm uh, acting as the chief engineer of uh, Regulus uh, Cyber for the past two years. Uh, I hold the BSc and MSc in mechanical engineering uh, from the Technion, uh, majoring in uh, electro optics and uh, material science. Uh, at the beginning of the way, I uh, used uh, to work for the semiconductor industry for applied materials, and later on, uh, for the most of my uh, career, I used to work for a defense uh, contractor in Israel called Rafael, dealing with uh, multidisciplinary discipline, disciplinary uh, systems. Um, Roy? Yes. So uh, I'd like to start off uh, by mentioning a very important uh, differentiation in the world of cybersecurity. 
Uh, traditional cybersecurity addresses multiple threats that uh, address the internet connection, the infotainment systems, even the ECU. Overall, this is a, a, a very vast field of cybersecurity, and there are multiple companies addressing it. I only put a few logos here, but you may be familiar with some of them. Uh, and uh, Regulus is addressing a side of cybersecurity that uh, I would say was left unaddressed for a very long time. And that's the direct threat, the offline threat uh, regarding sensors and any inputs from the environment. And that threat is uh, slowly growing, and we will understand for other presentation why, and uh, requires more attention. And Regulus is a group of people who are dealing with those kind of uh, direct offline threats in the defense industry and identify the gap in the civilian commercial market. So Regulus is a civilian company offering uh, civilian cybersecurity technologies to protect any inputs from the environment and that regards uh, to sensor. So that's uh, sensor cybersecurity in a nutshell. Now, when I say sensor cybersecurity, there is a wide array of uh, sensors currently used in vehicles today, uh, GNSS being one of them, but also uh, odometer, cellular, compass, LIDAR, camera, radar, and uh, IMU, inertial movement unit. Uh, some of you may not be familiar with the term GNSS, uh, but I will explain in the following slide what is the difference between GNSS and uh, GPS. So just before we dive into that, there are two ways today to provide vehicle positioning. The first one is called uh, SLAM, Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. And that's essentially using the visual sensors, uh, camera, radar, and uh, LIDAR primar primarily, in order to help the vehicle recognize where it's currently located. Just like you do today with your eyes as a driver, you can recognize the road you're driving on. You are familiar with the road. And that's one method of uh, navigation that exists today. And you can usually find it on many autonomous vehicle projects on the road today. Uh, this method has... Uh, Two main limitations. Uh, number one, uh, you need to give the vehicle the capability of understanding what to expect. So you have to get HD mapping, a very accurate uh, layout of uh, the road and the surroundings. So the vehicle can cross-reference that with the sensor input. And the second limitation is bandwidth. So that's a lot of information that has to flow from the sensors and being analyzed in real time for the vehicle to understand where it is. So while being uh, accurate, uh, it's very limited to a certain area uh, in which the vehicle has uh, the mapping information in advance. Uh, GNSS is uh, using basically the GNSS receiver, uh, which is a pretty cheap component if you compare it to other sensors. And it combines the uh, information in many cases with the IMU and the odometer to provide you, the driver, with uh, an accurate fix on your location. Now, as I mentioned, GNSS is slightly different than GPS. And throughout this presentation, I might use them interchangeably, but I'm always talking about GNSS. GPS is the American Satellite uh, Navigation Network. In addition to that, you also have the European Galileo, the Russian GLONASS, and the Chinese Baidu. All of these networks are currently operational. And when you activate location services on your phone, for example, or in most vehicles, you normally connect to several of them, if not all of them at the same time. Because the way GNSS receivers work is that they always aspire to connect to as many satellites as possible. The more satellites you have connection with, the better accuracy and the better um, uh, precision you have for your navigation and position requirements. GNSS stands for Global Navigation Satellite System, and that's an umbrella term for all of those constellations. So. Saying GPS in many cases today is already incorrect because it's very rare that a receiver is using only the American GPS system. Most receivers are multi-constellation receivers today and are using uh, two, three, or all four at the same time. And one more remark that it's important to say, GNSS satellites provide location, which is what we're going to focus on throughout this presentation. But they also provide time. And there's a lot of timing systems around the globe that rely on the time input from the GNSS satellite network. And as reg in Regulus, we also address uh, that threat of basically uh, hacking uh, timing systems. But for this presentation, we will focus on the location aspect of uh, GNSS. 
So what is GNSS spoofing? I saw many of you marked on the survey that you never heard the term before. So uh, GNSS spoofing or GNSS hacking as more commonly known is the concept of uh, trying to overtake the existing satellite signal. So as I said, each satellite transmits position in time towards an amount of approximately 8 billion receivers around the world that currently exist in mobile phones and vehicles and airplanes and ships and trucks. And uh, all of them are utilizing that information in real time. But the hacker can transmit fake GNSS signal and use that fake signal in order to overtake the existing signal coming from space. Now, doing that is actually quite simple because the satellite signal is extremely weak. That's because of the long journey it's doing from the satellites and the actual architecture of the way GNSS was designed. So if you essentially transmit a GNSS signal here on Earth, it is quite feasible to take over a system by transmitting signals that are much stronger than the ones coming from space. And you can simply transmit time and location, and receivers in your vicinity will lock on to your fake signal. And that way, you can inject false information into a certain target. Now, a really good analogy with two images that I really like to the difference between uh, being uh, jammed or blocked to being spoofed is this one. So let's say you're a driver and someone is uh, jamming your sensors. It's essentially like putting a blindfold on your eyes. You're not getting any sensor input, but you're also aware of the fact that you're not getting any input. And that's why you will attempt to stop the car. You will drive more carefully. You'll be alert. And this is how each system would behave uh, in a real scenario when the input suddenly cuts away. Spoofing, however, is almost like putting a VR headset on your face. And you're seeing a reality completely different than what it actually is. But there's no way for you to tell. And that way, you continue driving normally, but according to the information you are fed through the VR headset. And that's essentially the same way that sensor spoofing or GNSS spoofing trick a system. So why now? What's the reason that suddenly uh, there is a surge in uh, GNSS-based attacks? Well, the simple answer is uh, cost. It used to be uh, an investment of about a quarter of a million dollars to get a high quality uh, RF generator like the one you see here in order to be able to generate the exact same signal coming from the GNSS satellites. In recent years, a new development started uh, becoming very popular called an SDR or a software defined radio. Software defined radio is a research tool. It's a cheap research tool that was made to allow uh, people from around the, gl the globe, students, uh, scientists, and even hobbyists accessing the world of RF, radio frequencies, and trying different experiments of transmitting or intercepting different transmissions. This SDR can be modified to generate a signal identical to the one coming from the GNSS satellites in space. So essentially, and unintentionally, SDRs became the main attack tool in order to hack GNSS systems around the globe. And this cheap $100 tool can transmit a signal that can take over ships, airplanes, uh, timing uh, systems in critical infrastructure, and automotive. When you look at cybersecurity threat, first of all, if, the, if being able to conduct the attack is a cheap, uh, it, it, it's a cheap method, then it's already making it a very risky uh, cyber attack because it's accessible. The second thing, it's easy. I won't go into uh, details, but uh, if you Google the concept of GPS spoofing or hacking, you'll see many guides and many results, uh, mainly because this is something that many hobbies do either for fun or to hack different uh, innocent purposes. For example, there's a lot of Pokemon Go players who are using SDR in order to hack the GPS on their phone and uh, go catch Pokemons in places that are far away or without even leaving their home. And that just proves to you how easy it is to do. And the third is dangerous. As I mentioned, the spoofing can uh, actually affect an entire area. It's not only limited to a specific target. 
And uh, many GNSS receivers today are susceptible to this kind of attack because of the simple logic rule that says always lock on to the strongest signal available, which means they would always lock on to the spoofer signal instead of the authentic one coming from space. An example that happened just a few months ago here in Israel. As you know, there was a large civil war waging in Syria. As part of that civil war, there were a lot of GPS spoofing attacks from both sides. One of those attacks was so powerful that it actually affected the Ben Gurion Airport, which is Israel's main international hub of transportation. Many airplanes actually reported that they are seeing their location shifting or disappearing. And this is what you call collateral damage. It wasn't intentional, but the spoofing signal was extremely strong. And that also affected the ride-sharing service here in Israel. Our most popular ride-sharing service right now is called GET, short for GET Taxi. And many cab drivers and users could not use the service because the spoofing also um, made the location inaccurate. So essentially, you cannot order a taxi, or uh, the taxis cannot actually see the location of the passengers. So that gives you an idea of the massive impact that a spoofing attack can have, all the way from transportation systems to location-based services. And there are giant businesses, including Uber and Lyft and many mapping companies that rely on the fact that GPS is always available and always true. And that puts the ent that entire industry in jeopardy. Now, uh, Instances of uh, GNSS spoofing actually occur worldwide. This is just headlines from the past year. Uh, and in, in it's increasing because there are multiple industries that are relying on it very heavily. And different types of hackers, either for monetary purposes or for experimental purposes, are causing all kinds of uh, incidents around the globe. In the case of automotive specifically, there are many use cases for GNSS. We all know the number one use case, which is navigation. We either use it on our phones or built in in our vehicle's dashboard. But there are many more uses uh, of GNSS in automotive. For example, ADAS systems, which is what we're going to explore today. Many driving assistant uh, systems are using GNSS data in order to uh, react or plan the route or adjust the driving speed or adjust the steering and many other considerations. Autonomous driving. As I mentioned, aside from SLAM, which is very uh, expensive method and complicated method of navigating, GNSS is all there is. And in order for a vehicle to know what is point A and what is point B and plan the route, GNSS is involved in that calculation. Location-based services, as we just uh, showed an example. Fleet management, especially in the world of tracking. Satellite road traffic monitoring services. And the whole concept of V2V and V2X and communicating with infrastructure, GNSS is a big part of it simply because it helps the infrastructure recognize the vehicles in the vicinity and transmit accordingly. Now, the way that we develop protection here at Regulus is always try to think like the hacker, analyze the different capabilities of an SDR uh, spoofer constantly challenge our own protection methods against those types of attacks and constantly develop the two, both the attack tools and the defense tools, in order for us to always be one step ahead of the hacker. Uh, in our research, we already attempted SDR hacking uh, on six very popular GNSS receiver chipsets, the most common ones on the market, nine different mobile phones, all of them from different OEMs, and uh, 11 different vehicles also from different OEMs. We have never encountered a GNSS system or receiver that we could not spoof. And that really raised the flag for us in understanding there is a very big back, uh, gap in the industry that needs to be addressed. And uh, just to mention, uh, in the case of vehicle and mobile phone spoofing, it's even more interesting because there are other sensors involved. For example, in phone, you have accelerometer or a compass. And we were always curious to see if those other sensors would be able to detect a mismatch with the incoming GNSS information and that way prevent the spoofing. 
And, and this is why you have to always keep in mind when you see the videos I'm about to show you that it's always surprising to see that we don't only spoof the GNSS receiver, we actually affect the entire system and the entire decision-making process. <clears throat> in this video, uh, and I hope you can see it uh, clearly on your screen, we are doing a simple experiment where we transmit fake satellite signal from an SDR towards uh, three different uh, mobile phones. All the mobile phones are currently located in our offices in Haifa. This is how the spoofing software looks like. We're just transmitting coordinates. And as you can see, all three phones jump at the same time, change location at the same time to the highway. And we are also able to mimic movement by transmitting uh, constantly changing coordinates that are making the system think that it's currently moving south on the highway. And that just to show you the powerful capability of uh, the collateral effect of uh, spoofing and being able also to create a scenario. And even though all, this, all of these uh, mobile devices are inside our office in this video, we have a repeater in our offices, which is basically uh, transmitting the live feed of the sky outside our office in order for us to mimic an outdoor environment within our office. So this, all of these phones that you see here actually had the relocation in, in real time, and we were still able to overtake the existing signal with the SDR signal. Now, the research that really made the GP GNSS spoofing part of the cybersecurity headlines is a very interesting research that was done by Southwest Research Institute at the Black Hat Conference, the world's largest cybersecurity conference that takes uh, place every year. And uh, during that uh, uh, talk, they actually showed uh, the following video in which they took a vehicle that was entirely reliant on GNSS for navigation and were able to cause a small shifts in, in movement by creating a GNSS offset. So in the beginning of the video, you see the car going in a straight line uh, using the real uh, GNSS uh, information coming into the car. And now the, the spoofing starts and creates an offset. The car is trying to create that offset, but in reality, it's actually driving off the road. Now, this is a very uh, an extreme example, I have to say, because the car is using only GNSS. It doesn't cross-reference the information with any other sensor. But this extreme example was done to show that a vehicle can drive quite well with GNSS. And it's very risky to use only GNSS because if you spoof it, then you have complete control over the vehicle's trajectory. This made us consider the fact that maybe, just maybe, a vehicle on the road today that does have other sensors, including GNSS, might be susceptible to a GNSS spoofing attack. And we wondered whether we will be able to take control of the vehicle's uh, driving mechanisms using the same attack method. And uh, we decided to uh, go for Tesla. Uh, as you can see in this uh, several screenshots, that experiment became very viral. I think it was uh, almost 124 publications, 42 languages. It was a really uh, big wake-up call for many companies uh, in the GNSS industry and also in the automotive industry in uh, addressing uh, GNSS receivers uh, as just like any other component, as a cybersecurity uh, issue that needs to be addressed. The reason we chose Tesla is, first of all, that's the only level two vehicle that is available to rent, at least at that uh, time point and the end of last year. And they really wanted to test spoofing on a level two vehicle because we assumed, at least in theory, uh, that it's using GNSS some way as part of the ADA system. Number two, we knew for sure the Tesla has a feature, and I'll discuss this feature in the next slide, uh, using GNSS. And number three, they just launched something called Navigate on Autopilot, uh, which is a, a very advanced autonomous driving capability that navigates the vehicle instead of the driver. And we have to assume that all the vulnerabilities you're about to see exist across all vehicles with very high probability, because many of the vehicles on the road today are using the exact same uh, GNSS receiver architecture, very similar brands and designs. 
and uh, none of them were planned, at least uh, in theory, to withstand a software-defined radio uh, spoofing attack. Some uh, general guidelines for the experiment. Uh, we wanted to test uh, an effect only on the car under testing, so we created a very special spoofing mechanism that was isolated to the car itself. We made sure there is zero effect on any other vehicle or GNSS receivers in the vicinity. Uh, we uh, involved uh, in the process a very low gain antenna that we tested. We got the regulatory approvals involving that. And uh, we kept a very minimal distance between the transmitter and the receiver. And the experiment was monitored by a professional driver and an experiment team around the car. Some of the equipment used uh, was a laptop. The price tag doesn't really matter in that case. And we also used two software-defined radios in this experiment, one for spoofing and the other one for jamming. Uh, the reason is we discovered uh, during the experiment that the Tesla actually has some kind of a built-in mechanism where it compares the incoming GPS signal with the other GNSS constellation. So it's comparing it with Galileo and Baidu and GLONASS. And the way to overcome it was quite simple. Use one software-defined radio to spoof GPS and Galileo at the same time, while jamming, uh, jamming uh, Baidu and uh, GLONASS. And that way, there was no way for the system to compare the incoming signal with any other constellations. Uh, in addition, we had um, one PPS sync, which means we always made sure that the spoofer, the software-defined radio, is uh, synced with the existing satellite uh, constellations in real time in the sky in order for the attack to be seamless and for the takeover to be very stealthy. Two remarks about the Tesla. It has two features. If you've never driven one, I highly recommend it. It's extremely fun. Uh, one feature is called Autopilot, which is essentially a, an adaptive cruise control system uh, that adjusts the speed, uh, stays in the center of the lane, and you have to hold the wheel at all times uh, while this is active. Uh, and also the upgraded feature, Navigate on Autopilot, which means that you get all the Autopilot features, but you can only activate it on highways uh, that have all the lanes facing in the same direction. You have to define a destination in advance. And what it does is it exits the highway for you at the designated interchange. So you give it a destination. It identifies which exit needs to take and it activates the blinker and exits the highway on its own. So at this part of the presentation, I will be going back and forth between the actual uh, presentation file and a Google Chrome tab that I have open with the movie. Uh, this is because of some technical limitations uh, with Google uh, Meet. And I wanted to make sure that you get the audio as well and not just the video in that case. So the first. Uh, scenario that we tested was if we can actually divert a vehicle off the road using spoofing. So what we did was the car had a destination, and we activated Navigate on Autopilot. And the Navigate on Autopilot decided that the next large interchange was the designated exit for the car. We then spoofed the vehicle to think that it currently already reached that interchange, and that actually engaged uh, the exit maneuver, and the car identified a small pit stop as the designated exit and drifted right into that pit stop at a very high speed, as, assuming this is the correct exit. And there was no driver approval required because the, this is what Navigate Autopilot does. It exits the highway for you, and after it finishes the exiting uh, maneuver, it lets you take uh, manual control over again. What we see here, by the way, is classic sensor fusion, because this could not have been done if there was no small pit stop on the right-hand side. The car wouldn't just drive off the road into uh, the shoulders or into a wall or anything like that, because at the same time that the GNSS says you reach the interchange, the camera and the radar systems verified it's safe to take that maneuver. And that means also making sure there's a dotted white line on the right-hand side, so the vehicle perform the maneuver, but at the wrong location. So let's uh, see how uh, this video looks like. I'm going to uh, minimize the presentation. And let me know uh, if uh, on the chat if this is visible to everyone. OK. 
Okay, so you should now see it uh, full screen. And I'm gonna play the video and then I'll continue uh, talking because I want you to uh, hear the video, uh, the audio yourself. The road. Okay, rip navigate on autopilot. Just started. The car just took a right turn on its own. The blinker, the wheel turning, everything on its own. Okay. So that was uh, the vehicle being uh, spoofed and then uh, relocating uh, to uh, the nearest speed stop. I know it's quite fast and uh, sometimes it's hard to understand exactly what is happening, but I I'm, can also share afterwards the link for you to, to view it uh, slower. Okay, so back for the presentation. Now we'll go for uh, scenario number two. Because So in scenario number two, the braking system we noticed is also using GNSS in some way because the Tesla was able to see uh, the road speed limit and adjust the autopilot speed accordingly. We weren't sure if it is camera input because some vehicles uh, actually recognize uh, road signs or GNSS input, so we put it to the test. What we essentially did is uh, the car was driving an autopilot on 100 kilometer uh, road uh, speed limit. We spoofed the vehicle to a nearby road that had a, a very strict 33 kilometer per hour speed limit. And then as anticipated, uh, the car was using GNSS to decide on the maximum speed allowed and slowed down the vehicle. And uh, now we will see uh, the, that video. I'll go back to the uh, Chrome tab. Okay, and then again, I'll let the video play and I'll speak afterwards. And again, the car is heavily braking all the way to, uh, oh, it's slowing down for some reason. Slowing down dramatically in the middle of the highway. Look at it, all the way from 100 to 33. I'm not touching the brakes because probably the, okay, so it's changing to the lane in front of me. Look, there's a car coming. I had to change back. There was a car coming. I had to manually grab the wheel. Okay, no, 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 okay. Yeah, so I'm back. Uh, sorry, you got a sneak peek to the next uh, scenario, but we'll go back to that soon. So, uh, by the way, you should notice uh, we, we zoom in uh, on the actual uh, feed that the Tesla is showing to the driver on the location information. And if you'll notice, there is a complete mismatch between where the Tesla is showing it is than what you physically see through the window on the road. And that gives you a clear indication that there is uh, really no, um, uh, no cross-reference with the visual sensors in identifying that the environment really fits what the GNSS uh, sees. Okay. The last scenario and the most worrying one, and that's actually the scenario that made us uh, contact Tesla, go public about this a few months later, and uh, really made this into a big issue, because that's a life-threatening uh, scenario, is that uh, we actually unintentionally made the car drive into the opposing lane. The way we did that is, as I mentioned earlier, Navigate an Autopilot should only be available to the driver to activate, on a highway with all the lanes facing in the same direction. So what would happen if we would reverse the situation? If the car is physically driving uh, a road that has two opposing lanes, but we spoof the car to a highway that has all the lanes facing in the same direction, then suddenly we notice that it automatically activates the Navigate on Autopilot feature. And then we also had a destination that required a left, side, left turn exit. So the vehicle, maneuvered into the opposing lane as part of its uh, preparation for exiting the highway. And that means that just by using wireless remote spoofing, you can cause a level two vehicle to drive into incoming traffic. And none of the sensors are capable of stopping that from happening because they were never designed uh, to this uh, scenario.
so let's see how it uh, will look how it looks like in uh, real time Okay, I'll play the video and uh, I'll speak afterwards. It's a bit fast. Uh, there are two instances which we managed to record it. Okay, no, no, no. Okay, the Tesla does not react in time. Being spoofed to the interchange itself. Okay, so that was the, that example. I unfortunately don't have the second one, uh, but uh, it's pretty much the same. The car suddenly starts doing a left blinker, as you saw, and they're diver diverting into the opposing lane on uh, its own. Now, uh, we see an increase, as I said, in spoofing incidents, and I, I think that what we proved in that experiment shows that the potential uh, the risk potential is massive, is that there's always monetization uh, involved in cybersecurity threats. And uh, that means that uh, there's always some kind of um, a reasoning that can make profit for the attacker in conducting the attack. Oh, sorry, I'm just going to show you my screen. So there are three ways you can monetize GPS proofing that we see in real time today out there on the field with information that we received from our uh, customers. Number one, uh, sabotaging uh, ride sharing and under LBS services. Uh, there's a lot of drivers that actually use spoofing in order to uh, get uh, money from the location-based service. Uh, they can simply teleport themselves to the destination or pick up fake passengers and that way generate money from drives that never actually happen. This is something that's already taking place, and there are several uh, headlines about it in the media. Freight and cargo theft. And this is something that is uh, increasingly common in uh, South America, but also other regions around the world where uh, trucks, mostly, that are using GNSS uh, for uh, securing themselves, calling for law enforcement or uh, having a special locking mechanism on the cargo that is uh, geofenced. Uh, the attackers are actually using uh, spoofing in order to open the cargo door or to prevent law enforcement from reaching the location where they ambush the truck, and that way they can uh, steal cargo. And lastly, a uh, vehicle theft. So we have a lot of new services where you can actually unlock a vehicle with your phone. There are companies that are uh, basically renting out vehicles they have parked all over the city, such as Car2Go. You approach the vehicle, you unlock it with your phone, you can drive it in a certain geofenced area. You have to return it to the same parking uh, slot normally. Uh, using spoofing, you can actually steal the car because on their screen, uh, in the fleet monitoring center, they actually see the car not moving while essentially you're taking it uh, far away and stealing the vehicle. Those are just a few examples, and I'm sure many more will pop up uh, throughout uh, 2020 and 2021 as this is increasing in popularity. Uh, beyond the financial losses, it's also damaging the brand image. And as you saw, it's a massive uh, safety risk. And uh, from this slide onwards, uh, I'll give uh, Drawer uh, the opportunity to present some of the technical details uh, behind the GNSS and uh, our uh, technology. So thank you, Roy. Uh, at the beginning of uh, this presentation, you mentioned uh, the difference between uh, GNSS and uh, GPS where in general uh, GNSS is the common term for all the, the satellite-based navigation services uh, lean on uh, four different systems uh, launched by uh, four different uh, countries, uh, where GPS is uh, one of them uh, that was uh, uh, pioneerly uh, launched by uh, the United States of America. Now, from now on, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, regarding the principles of uh, the GPS, but uh, the principles are in uh, general similar for uh, all of the, the systems uh, out there. Uh, 
Uh, and here and there, I'll uh, point out the differences between the different uh, systems. The GPS uh, global positioning system is uh, actually a system that build uh, from uh, 32 satellites out there in space orbiting Earth. Uh, usually called the SVs, where, which stands for a space vehicle. And we can uh, basically, we can understand the reason uh, of uh, looking for a solution like that for uh, positioning, because from uh, the dawn of uh, mankind, uh, people used to uh, raise their eyes up to the skies and uh, to use stars for uh, all kinds of different purposes, among them uh, in order to navigate. So at the same way that uh, people used to use the uh, stars in the sky in order to navigate, uh, the idea popped up to uh, have uh, artificial uh, stars in the form of satellites orbiting Earth. And in that way, uh, the GPS uh, was born as uh, uh, the number of uh, satellites uh, launched out to space emerged and uh, make the ability to uh, use them in order to uh, acquire a positioning solution he here on Earth. So there are today already uh, 32 uh, space vehicles for the GPS systems, in addition to a numerous num number of uh, other satellites from each one of the other uh, systems, uh, GLONASS, uh, Baidu and Galileo by uh, Russia, China and Europe, uh, uh, all over the, the globe, uh, in which for the GPS, uh, the last one that was launched was uh, launched uh, recently in the past year and is still in uh, uh, evaluation. Out of these uh, 32 uh, uh, satellites, only 27 are uh, in actually use, where the rest five of them uh, is uh, as standby. So you can understand there is a redundancy of the system. The system is uh, well designed. In order to have coverage uh, on any uh, point on, on the globe, actually only 24 satellites are being used in order to have the coverage, and additional three are used uh, in order to uh, uh, have better accuracy in the positioning solution. Uh, the number of visible satellites on a given time at a given point on Earth uh, without having a concealment varies between 5 to 10, where usually on each point on Earth, a receiver can see uh, uh, usually nine satellites. And these satellites are orbiting uh, at an altitude of approximately 20,000 kilometers, which is uh, 12,600 miles. Uh, and it's designed to have a period of 12 hours. In, in, so in that way, where the satellite, each satellite have 20 hours uh, period, it completes uh, uh, two orbits uh, uh, each sidereal day, repeating uh, the same ground track. Now, that was very helpful at the beginning when uh, GPS was just uh, started. Uh, and we see in a few slides uh, how many satellites, the minimum number is needed in order to have a, a positioning solution that it uh, gave the ability uh, while having only the first four satellites out in space to give uh, the US Army the ability to have a positioning solution uh, at the specific regions that they were uh, interested uh, to have. Beside of these uh, satellites uh, orbiting uh, uh, Earth, there are ground management stations that are used in order to uh, communicate with the satellites. Uh, they and only they can communicate with their satellites, where the receivers, the common receivers, are only uh, uh, receiving messages coming from the satellites and cannot talk back uh, to the satellite. Now, each one of these satellites have a, a synchronized time uh, between each other, uh, usually uh, updated and uh, corrected by the ground uh, management station. And that is achieved by uh, using a very accurate uh, atomic clock where each uh, satellite is equipped with. Uh, <clears throat> 
The trajectory of uh, each satellite uh, is well known uh, as part of the design of the system. And in that way, the receiver have the knowledge of what is the trajectory of each uh, space vehicle on each uh, uh, time uh, uh, and uh, from how it would be uh, seen from each uh, point on Earth. And that helps uh, actually uh, the receiver to calculate the positioning uh, and have the positioning solution by having uh, receiving uh, uh, messages from the satellite. <clears throat> the satellite itself transmits uh, the data and we will see the, we will see the, the, the construction of uh, each message uh, in a second. But uh, in that way, when the receiver uh, gets uh, these messages out of the satellites, it can actually uh, measure in a way the time of flight came from the satellite. And in that way, the time of flight actually implies the, the, the distance between the receiver and the satellite. Uh, so in that way, having uh, distances uh, from uh, four satellites giving the ability for the receiver to calculate the the position on earth on two dimension plus the third dimension of height and in addition to that to calculate the uh, precise time these uh, the distances between the the satellite and the, the receiver are used to call the pseudo ranges uh, they call pseudo ranges uh, rather than ranges because uh, the time is accurate up to the level of the difference between the receiver time and the real satellite time. Plus additional uh, effects uh, caused by uh, atmospheric uh, uh, variables and uh, so on and so forth. <clears throat> now, a little bit uh, regarding uh, the construction of the messages coming out of the GPS uh, satellites. Each, uh, now, once again, I'm, I'm describing here the way the GPS technology works for the GPS system. The principles are similar to the other systems, but differ in a, a few ways. Uh, for the GPS signal, uh, the way the system was designed is to have a single frequency on which the signal coming from the receiver will be transmit on. For the GPS technology, on the L1 frequency, the number is 1.575 gigahertz, meaning that all of the space vehicles, all of the satellites are transmitting this, the, their messages on this uh, exact uh, frequency. So the receiver needs to listen only to this frequency with a very uh, small bandwidth uh, at, and have at the same frequency all of the space vehicles. The way to differ between those vehicles, the space, the satellites, is by having different characterization for each one of them. The way to achieve that is by using a, a pattern called the gold code or the a pseudo random number. Gold codes are numbers are actually a, a, a signals or, or I would say, I would call it a, a, a generated number, a binary generated number a, by a, a pseudo a random generator. And for the GPS, this number stands on 1023 bits which are transmitted on a 1,023 kilobit per second, causing having a period of one millisecond. So each one millisecond, this code is repeat itself. Taking this code and exclusive or with navigational data, which is the data of the eph ephemeris, which is the trajectory, the trajectory of each satellite with the gold code gives us a signal which is unique for each one of the satellite. Now, in that way, the receiver 
after demodulating the signal, can differentiate between each one of these satellites to others. In the GLONASS system, it's a little bit different. There are no different gold codes for each one of the satellites. And the way to differ between different satellites is by listening on different frequencies, meaning there is a central frequency for generating, for transmitting the signal for GLONASS, but each one of the satellites in the GLONASS system transmits signals on different frequencies. So the, very, the, the way to different, differentiate between different satellites is by listening to different uh, channels. Back to GNSS, to, back to GPS, once having the gold code uh, exclusive odd with the navigational data, uh, which uh, is transmitted on 50 uh, bits per second, and actually having a, a navigation message that holds all the data regarding the navigation message coming from the space vehicle, it is being modulated with a carrier of the 1.575 megahertz, getting a BPSK, a, a binary phase shift keying uh, signals, and we as we can see on the bottom of the uh, slide. Once the signal reached the receiver, now the receiver needs to look for this signal. Now, Roy mentioned at the beginning of uh, the presentation that the signal uh, reaching to Earth is very weak. It's so weak in a way that it, it uh, reached uh, the surface of Earth below the noise floor. And if the noise floor is 80, minus 80 dBm, the signal coming from the satellite is even lower, stands on minus 130 dBm usually, which means that in, in normal ways of tracking signals, uh, it won't be possible to uh, acquire the signal and track it. So in order to uh, let the, uh, uh, give the ability to the receiver to uh, uh, track and get locked on the signal coming from the satellite, First, the receivers are designed to be very, very sensitive. And second, a, a mechanism and techniques of signal processing are being uh, used in order to try and look for a replica of the gold code, which a copy of them is already in possess with the receiver. And in that way, the receiver is able to search through, through uh, through uh, two domains of frequency shift and code time shift, allowing the receiver to look for a correlation where it gets a correlation between the maintained copy, a replica actually, of the goal code and the one comes from the receiver. Once a correlation is acquired, a correlation peak uh, rises uh, in the in the code the time frequency shift uh, domains uh, uh, domain and from there on the receivers start to track this satellite and in this slide we can see an example of correlation peak for a specific uh, space vehicle uh, satellite number uh, 31 of the uh, GPS system once the receiver tracks uh, at least four different space vehicles. Beside of having the first preamble bit, which is a kind of synchronizing event for the specific uh, uh, 3D uh, fix, actually to have a positioning uh, solution of the uh, positioning system, <clears throat> it start to gain the messages from different space vehicles. In this slide, we can see an example of having uh, signals from PRN number 9, 11, 14, and 17. And in that way, it gives the receiver the knowledge of the pseudo range between the receiver itself and four different satellites. Having the, these distances between the receiver and the satellites, allowing the receiver to calculate the position of the receiver itself 
uh, using a method called trilateration, where trilateration is actually a, a way of having distances between known points and calculating the position of the objecting uh, receiver by wrapping the, the transmitters, actually the receivers, with spheres and taking each one of these spheres and looking for the cross section between them. Having only two space vehicles will give us two uh, uh, points where the spheres are intersect. In that way, the accuracy will be low. Adding a third uh, space vehicle with a third sphere will give us more accurate solution because the accuracy is lowered and now you have a better accuracy uh, actually not lowered but better accuracy of the positioning solution uh, uh, and w, um, ambiguity is a little bit lower so gnss is great technology uh, actually we do want to use gnss when we need it uh, giving a gnss a lower priority over sensors will make uh, ADAS to be more complicated. And instead of lowering the priority of uh, GNSS, Well, I think we lost Chor. Just give him a minute to Reestablish his connection. All right. Well, it, it looks like we lost Roy and Roar. Um, hopefully, they'll be able to uh, dial back in quickly. Just give us two minutes while we take care of this technical issue, and then we'll continue back on with the presentation. In the meantime, we can also take a look here at the polls. Um, so if you'd like to participate in the poll, you can go to pollev.com slash ASRG and you can put in here your location, kind of share with the group, the community of where your uh, located currently. The poll is completely anonymous, so if uh, you don't have to worry about your information being shared or not. Hello, we're back. Uh, hi, Roy. Great. So uh, we'll switch back over to Roy and Dror and finish the GPS presentation. Very good. Okay, so sorry for that. Uh, so So spoofing receiver versus fooling the system, uh, as we said, actually this the signal strength uh, reaching Earth from satellite is very weak, and uh, for that reason, you just need to be a little bit uh, stronger in terms of power, which make it very easy to spoof a receiver. 
receiver may lose a lock in means of a 3D fixed solution for a few seconds before locking onto the spoofing signal, but uh, it can be even a seamless uh, spoofing if when using a, a sophisticated and a, a well-tuned uh, uh, tools. Uh, receiver will report false position uh, or time even though there is a jump in uh, uh, position or end time. And we saw all of these examples while uh, testing and evaluating uh, systems as part of our uh, red team work. And receiver uh, that we've tested has no way of knowing it, uh, that it is being spoofed and uh, when spoofing has stopped. So actually it's very vulnerable. On the other hand, system, needs some planning in order to be a, a to lower the count on gps genesis and the system is getting false position or time uh, even though the system has more data from other sensor odometer imu compass radar and camera it's hard for the system to design when there is contradiction between the data uh, coming from certain uh, sensor and the other sensor which one of them is right and which one is wrong and in in that in the example of autonomous driving you can't uh, afford yourself a, a count on the majority vote uh, you need to have a, in terms of safety a, a solution that compromise one with each other and a, I think that instead of lowering the priority of uh, GNSS and counting on other system it's better to add additional solution of uh, validating and verifying that the data is uh, accurate. <clears throat> now, even though that uh, uh, the, the receiver can check time shift, hacker can be uh, perfectly aligned with real-time signals, achieving the seamless takeover and making it very hard to detect. And even though the check position shift, and I, I saw that was a question regarding the jump of position, hacker can always start the spoofing to the current position of the target. And when it does that, the, the receiver do not have a, a, an instance jump, a major jump, and it locked on the fake signal. And now the hacker can uh, drift the location of the receiver without him knowing. Multi-constellation receiver as a backup uh, is a good thing to have, but hacker can always spoof other constellation as well, or just jam them and spoof the main constellation it'd like to uh, spoof. And the same way having multi-frequency receiver, because each one of the system has more than one uh, frequency to uh, uh, transmit the signals, in the same way, the hacker can jam other frequencies and spoof the certain uh, frequency he's interested to spoof. Accurate receiver clock is uh, something uh, rare to have on the common uh, usage of Genesis receiver. It usually comes on uh, high-end, very expensive receivers, but uh, at the same way, having a very accurate clock on the receiver level, the hacker as well can use a T60, O60, or even rubidium atomic clock Will make which make the uh, spoofing equipment to be uh, more expensive, but once again, it's just a matter of will and effort to have the spoofing uh, happening. Regarding navigation message authentication, all kind of techniques that are being implemented mainly in the GLONASS, uh, excuse me, in uh, Galileo systems, you can always use a replay attack with a time shift in order to fool and spoof a receiver. And even though there will be a corrupt uh, CRC, the receiver will still track the signal and, and follow and give the uh, spoof position. And we saw that IMU consistency using odometer and sensor fusion, sensor fusion on commercial grade IMUs, they, they drift, they tend to drift very fast and the sense of fusion aim to improve accuracy, uh, uh, it will improve accuracy, will not um, uh, uh, improve the security. Now, 
we know that if we uh, divide the autonomous driving into level two, level three on one hand, having level four, level five on the other hand, level two and level three always will have driver in the loop. So when spoofing is detected, we don't see a need to alert the driver that he's being spoofed. If a system uses level two, level three, and is being spoofed, the only thing he needs to do is to inform the driver that he needs to take over again. And for that reason, the detection is very important to these two levels. And this is the detection software that we here in Regulus are developing in order to help those uh, uh, systems to hand over the control to the driver. Level four and level five will not satisfy by having only a detection mechanism because that in level four and uh, hopefully in the future in level five where the full autonomy will reach to the market, detection will not be enough and a mitigation uh, solution will be a must because there, it's not planned that the driver will be in the loop in order to take over on these levels. So in seeing this perspective, once again, here in Regulus, we are developing also a mitigation tools that can be incorporated. And once the spoofing is detected, the system can also mitigate the problem and keep maintaining a real right a solution hand over to the system to use it. Now, the usual use, uses of GNSS receiver passes to the user only three main uh, 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 parameters, the position, the velocity, and the time. But in order to reach these parameters as part of the solution, there are a wealth of other parameters that can be used in order to verify the PNT authentication. These parameters include starting with the navigation message itself and additional uh, parameters, the pseudo ranges being uh, uh, calculated for each one of the satellites and so on and so forth. And using this parameter, our algorithm knows how to use them in order to, to see whenever the receiver is being locked and reporting a spoof position. Adding to that, as a solution of a standalone solution inside the system, we also developing a solution for PNT authentication as a service coming out from a, the network as a server, where each one of the parameter is used as a client on a server client network, where it reports to the server these parameters not the position of the receiver itself, but just the parameters is being received. The server cannot uh, obtain the position of each one of these receivers, but using the parameters, he can compare them and take a decision whether these parameters are right coming from satellites or wrong coming from the spoofer itself. Regarding mitigation, well, we said that we have the correlation for uh, each one of the satellites. Now, looking on the time Doppler domain, the, the frequency shift and time shift domain that I mentioned before, when we have real solution for coming from satellites, for each one of the satellites, we will have only one correlation. Now, we see here three graphs for three different satellites where there is more than one a correlation peak, uh, and actually we can see two correlation peaks. Now, in this example, we know that the first correlation peak, yet we can't know and tell which one of them is the right one coming from satellite, and we see another correlation peak that is actually coming from a spoofer. Now, we have developed a tool that make the use of signal processing which allows it to differentiate between these two uh, correlation peaks and know which one is the authentic correlation peak that was achieved from a satellite rather than an, a satellite a, a correlation peak that did not come from the satellite. 
taking these uh, taking these uh, correlation peaks and arrange them into groups that are fit to authentic uh, correlation peak came from satellite and the others that came from the spoofer allow, allows us not only to detect that it was uh, a spoofing uh, occurred but also to differentiate it into two different solutions one of them is the right one which the algorithm will pass over to the system and the other one is the, the spoofing uh, uh, solution which the uh, the algorithm will block Thank you very much, Dor. It was an excellent technical overview. Uh, I'll just uh, finish up by showing you this uh, new executive order issued by President Trump, addressing the threat of GNSS uh, and positioning navigation and time security. This is another example how governments and regulators are taking direct involvement in enforcing cybersecurity rules for uh, protecting GNSS. And this is important because uh, recent events show that OEMs themselves are being held accountable to the cyber vulnerabilities found in their uh, vehicles. And to summarize, uh, as a, the industry as a whole has seen uh, security and reliability as a top priority, always has and always will. Cyber security solutions address mostly the connected threat. There is a wide uh, sensor based attack issue. Uh, GPS is at the heart of all location navigation and ADA systems. The threat of GPS spoofing is on the rise. Knowing when spoofing is actually occurring has a really big value to protecting navigation systems. And there is increasing global regulation around GNSS security standards. Uh, just a quick glance, but we can go uh, into it later on uh, using the email you see below. Uh, we have a very uh, specific set that in a way that we work with our customers. We provide a free of charge proof of concept to start off. And I highly invite you to take advantage of that. Except for fortifying your existing DNSS receivers that are already on the platform, using more sensor fusion is another way of mitigating spoofing, using SLAM technologies for backup, and always use red teams to test the resiliency of your systems. So that was uh, the presentation. There is a lot more we can uh, cover regarding the experiment. If you want to learn more, there is a link on the bottom left that you can see. Uh, and uh, we are open for questions, both Dror and I. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, this is uh, the hint where I come back to the game. Um, at first, also from our side, from RSG, um big thanks to you for this interesting talk and to bring um, also this new topic um, yeah, in, in the RSIG organization. It was really interesting. And um, let's start with answer some questions. So some I received, um, I would pick up as the first question. Um, how is the, in, the automotive industry's reaction um, about your research results, what is your feeling? Um, have they understood also the problem regarding the, the GNSS um, topic? And are they really willing to mitigate the risk? Um, what is your experience uh, at this point of time regarding this? Uh, so thank you for this question and thank you for reading it, Sven. Uh, this is a really good question because the comments that we received, first of all, we received a lot of responses. I think that nearly any of the large OEMs around the globe contacted us in some way with questions and clarifications. Uh, overall, it seems that everyone are very eager to address the problem. Uh, right now, as you can imagine, uh, the transition to level two uh, is uh, still ongoing. For many companies, the technologies that we showed in Tesla are either still in development or only planned for the next generation of vehicles. And we are already seeing interest in implementing this technology as part of the production line instead of retrofitting existing vehicles on the road uh, to ensure that uh, level two and level three ADA systems uh, are reliable and uh, safe. So overall, I'm seeing a, a very positive response to this research. It's important to mention, though, 
that uh, it's still unclear whether the GNSS receiver manufacturers are the ones that should address this, or is it the OEMs that should uh, retrofit it, uh, implementing into the existing GNSS receivers? That's a discussion that is still going on. Okay. Um, regarding the GNSS receivers, I also received a question. Um, do you made an overview about the different available GNSS receivers and could you recognize recognize differences related to security measures right now? Uh, so the good news is yes, there are some companies that make GNSS receivers that have some level of resiliency. Earlier, a drawer showed you a table with countermeasures. Those countermeasures are things we identified in existing commercial GNSS receivers on the market. Uh, very few of them had any kind of mechanism of protection, but those that did had those protections. Uh, as we stated, uh, we could overcome them. They created some delay for the attacker, some uh, inconvenience for the spoofer, but they are still being able to overcome. We, As uh, also I mentioned, we've never encountered a receiver that was completely immune uh, to a spoofing attack. Okay, thanks to, for the answer. Um, then the next question would be, um, makes the environment of the car which you want to spoof in the location a difference to the difficulty for a successful spoofing attack? So, for example, I think it makes a difference if you are nearly to the equator or if you are located um, in the north of the planet because the satellite constellations are different. Um, do you made some experience regarding this also? Sven, can you repeat the end of the question? I apologize, but you are breaking off. Okay, sorry. Um, the, I started at the beginning. So the question is, makes the environment and the location of the car you want to spoof a difference to the difficulty for the successful spoofing attack? So maybe um, it could make a difference um, if the car is near to the equator or of in the north of the planet where the satellite constellation is um, different or dif more difficult to receive exactly. Or also um, make a difference if you are in an urban environment like in Tokyo or somewhere in Nevada in the US, for example. So actually, uh, it the effect of the location of the target uh, over the success of the spoofing is very minor, meaning mm -hmm. it doesn't matter as long as the even if the receiver is in a wide open environment and have full uh, field of view out uh, to the sky, having the maximum available uh, satellites in, uh, in, uh, in the field of view. Uh, even then, uh, it's very simple for the spoofer to overcome uh, and to uh, hack every receiver just for the fact that the single strength will be higher and once the, the front end of the receiver facing such a strong signal, immediately it causes the AGC mechanism to drop and in that way, it cannot track and follow the real signals coming from satellite, making life very easier for spoofer. Okay, thanks for that. Um, another question is um, regarding the targets of evaluation you just have seen um, to do you made experience um, if for automated driving functions um, there are cars available which are only used GNSS for this um, automated driving like um, it seems to be in your videos or made you also experience that the um, car manufacturers uh, trust more um, combined systems with GNSS and other sensor fusions? And uh, did you made also experience to trick such fusion systems? So 
That's actually a very good question. Uh, and yes, we had the chance to see uh, level four uh, platforms on development stages uh, with different OEMs where we conducted the proof of concept uh, processes. Uh, and actually none of, none of them uh, was a, a system that is based uh, on sensors uh, that exclude the uh, GNSS receiver. All of them in a certain point, even though that had multiple LIDARs on top of the roof uh, and all kind of uh, radars and cameras, need to have a mechanism to calibrate the system at the beginning of the drive, meaning to have an initial understanding of the surrounding uh, uh, it is located in. And just after uh, having this calibration, Yes, uh, some of these uh, systems uh, uh, were able to uh, go on and uh, navigate using uh, the other system uh, without having the GNSS in use. But while understanding uh, this kind of mechanism, we realized that the only thing we need to do is to uh, operate the spoofer uh, prior to the ignition of the platform. And in that way, the platform is waking up to a spoofed uh, area and it cannot maintain the mission it was planned to do because it wasn't able to calibrate itself and to determine the right position it was in and uh, it was uh, useless. Mm -hmm. Thanks to this. Um, we received another question. Um, have the G5 technology any effect on GPS spoofing? The, the short answer to that question is that there is no uh, effect and no relation uh, between the cellular uh, network and the GNSS uh, signals coming from satellite. Mm -hmm. This was also like I expected to be um, honest. But thanks also for this uh, clarification. Um, then there pops up a question um, that the automotive industry is not um, the first industry, of course, which uses GNSS um, systems. Um, for example, uh, the military applications have uh, much more experience and um, yeah, used it for several more years. Um, have they? Do you know if they have um, similar issues um, still open to solve today? So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the military in general is not immune uh, for this kind of uh, spoofing and jamming. And a lot of uh, work is being done uh, through uh, uh, defense industries. Uh, usually, from what we know, when uh, 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 we research a little bit, the the Defense products are making use of uh, first very expensive uh, high-end uh, receivers, uh, which usually usually make the use of a much uh, more, I would say, uh, uh, sensitive and special uh, antennas uh, for first, uh, addition to uh, uh, sophisticated uh, receivers. Uh, I can tell uh, you that we did have the chance to uh, test uh, several kind uh, of uh, high-end, very sophisticated receivers that were spoofed. And a way to overcome uh, this problem is to use uh, multiple receivers on a certain platform. So in that way, there is a distance between the, the receivers. So uh, uh, it can differentiate uh, the signals and expect to have different solutions between one each other. And in that way, if you spoof uh, both of them, both of them will show the exact same uh, location. That's first. Second, uh, the GPS system uh, have uh, uh, an additional channel which is reversed for uh, reserved for uh, military uses. Uh, there are two uh, gold codes, and I didn't uh, went into deep details regarding that. The civil one is the course acquisition, uh, 
uh, which is open for the public. There is another channel which called the P channel or Y channel, the precise one, uh, which is encrypted. And the way to uh, uh, decode the data uh, that comes on that channel, uh, the, the US Air Force, which operates the GPS, uh, make the use of a, a specific key on the receiver on the ground level in order to decode these signals. But this is a privilege kept only to militaries and governments and not for the public. Mm -hmm. um, do you know something about for the public system again now um, that there is some work on some authentication mechanism? I think I heard um, that Galileo is planning to do something like that. Yes, uh, you're right about that. Uh, there is uh, work uh, being done uh, of adding uh, an authentication service uh, to the Galileo system. Uh, each mechanism of that kind introduce new challenges and new threats. In order to have uh, this kind of mechanism, you need to have a certain connectivity to the network, bringing us back to the 4G and in the future, the 5G. And the receiver will have to communicate both receiving the signal from satellite and authenticate it using uh, messages coming from the network, from the, from the internet. Now, once you're connecting to, to the receiver with additional network, you're exposing it to uh, new vulnerabilities that can come as cyber threats through the network. And I don't want to imply, but we all were witnesses to the 2019 outage of the Galileo system. I don't know if it have any relation to that, but we might see these kind of phenomena in case the receiver will be connected to another network, make it vulnerable to uh, uh, cyber uh, threats through the network. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, the next question is, um, for that, we have to look a little bit in the future. If we think, for example, to smart cities and the uh, cars are communicating with um, by using V2X and communicate with infrastructures and so on, do you think that this could also be helped to mitigate such spoofing, risk of spoofing attacks? In theory, this is an, op an option, but uh, in practicality, you have to remember that since spoofing is an attack that affects an entire vicinity, it would also affect the infrastructure. So you don't really have the cross-reference point you require. Uh, but uh, some infrastructure is designed to be more resilient, and maybe in the future that can be also a way to reduce the risk, but not to prevent it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for that. Um, then maybe one last question. Um, did you made also experience um, with tricking GPS apps um, in the in the kind to come through such apps to some fleet cloud services, for example? Um, well, I think that the question was if you can use an app to cause spoofing. And if that was the question, then yes, there are apps that you can install on Android, at least that we saw, that do like a local software only spoofing. There's no like real transmission that affect your own phone. And that information can also be affecting uh, your uploaded uh, location information to any services. Mm -hmm. OK, then I think this was a lot of questions that you had also answered at the end. Um, very thanks to this. And yeah, from my point of view, we are through with the question and answer se session. Um, so, John, want you, will you come back to <laughs> say some final words? Yeah, so thank you, Sven. Um, first okay. of all, thanks, Regulus, for, for taking the time today to present um, really interesting information. I think we could talk about 
um, GPS hacking uh, for another few hours, actually. But um, what's really interesting for me is that Regulus is focusing on the this sensor that's actually providing data for some of our most safety critical systems and vehicles and uh, ensuring that the, the data that the sensor is actually producing is correct uh, is something that's a little bit different focus than we, we normally see. So uh, Roy, Dror, thank you so much for taking the time today um, to right, the, thank you. <laughs> To the guys uh, on the webinar, uh, thanks for participating. Thanks for the questions. Um, Roy, Dror, do you have something to say before we close? Um, as you can see, there's an email on the screen, info at regulus.com. If you have any further inquiries, uh, this email reaches directly to me. So feel free to reach out. OK. Great. Well, thank you guys so much. And um, once again, next week, Thursday, uh, Thursday, I think it's May 14th. I have to look. Uh, May 14th, we have the next webinar. Come check it out. It's going to be another interesting topic, and uh, we'll see you there. All right. Thank you guys. Have a good day. Goodbye. Ciao. Goodbye.